This is Love You a Brunch, the show for those who'd rather be brunching. I'm Jody Stapler. Today I'm speaking to Robin Asbell, author, culinary instructor, public speaker, private chef, and the author of many cookbooks on healthy food and special diets. Today we're going to talk to her about her seventh cookbook, The Whole Grain Promise, more than 100 recipes to jumpstart a healthier diet. She's going to let us in on some great tips to help bring the whole grain foods into our diets and into the diets of our families. We're also going to talk about some things that have been in the news for the last couple years, such as the hype nut allergy in our country, the gluten-free diet that has become so popular, as well as many other things, such as artificial sweeteners. So stick around and love your brunch. So today I am speaking to Robin Asbell. Uh, Robin is a chef. She's a member of the IACP, International Association of Culinary Professionals. You've authored seven books. Uh, you also are a speaker. You're a private chef. And you also are an instructor. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, I do a lot of things, basically all involving food. <laughs> now, did you always start out with food? I mean, as a young kid, was that something that you just always went to? Oh, yeah. I was very passionate about eating and food, and my mother was a great cook and um, taught me how to cook. But um, I actually went to college to get a degree in fine art. So I was also, my father was an artist as well. So I kind of went that way and then just steered it right back into food. So you were an art student. Yes. Well, I went to, uh, got an undergraduate degree in uh, fine art, and then I went to graduate school for a year before deciding I would rather work in a restaurant. What made you change? You know, I really, at the time, was learning about all this stuff about, you know, how what you ate would affect the environment and how important it was to change the way that we ate as a as a people and as a society. And I was just so much more excited about it and felt that I could actually change the world with food, whereas with, with art, I felt like I was kind of moving into, you know, being in galleries or being in closed spaces, and I could reach more people with food. And it was certainly a – I was – because I worked in restaurants all the way through college. I actually started in high school just working in restaurants to, you know, to pay my way. So I found my home. I really enjoyed working, you know, the rhythm of the kitchen. Right, right. Now, um, I noticed that a lot of your books and a lot of things that are your blogs and everything, they're all health-related, of course, vegetarian, vegan, juicing, so forth. So are you vegan? I'm a vegetarian and I have been for a long, long time, And I, but I eat a little seafood and I um, eat a lot of vegan food, but I'm not exclusively vegan. And, and I also, I cook uh, meat and write meat things for people. I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of um, flexible to acknowledging that uh, other people eat however they want to eat. Right. I did notice that in your newest cookbook, Whole Grain Promise, more than 100 recipes to jumpstart a healthier diet, there were things in there that were not vegetarian. So it, it's not something that just vegetarians or vegans are going to want to go out and buy. Absolutely. Uh, th this book is really about just getting whole grains into anyone. You know, these are my most sort of appealing recipes that are easy so that, you know, people who just for some reason haven't gotten around to bringing those whole grains to their diet can do it easily. I'm also liking about your cookbook is you have the health benefits inside. So, you know, people that really want to research this for themselves and their families so that's a great part. And also your strategies for making it easy. I think that's a great part in your book as well. Yes, because, you know, honestly, uh, you know, people think, well, you know, eating healthy is suffering, but actually, you know, being unhealthy is suffering. So, you know, if you can eat really health-supportive foods that are delicious, then it's a win-win. Now, I'll be honest. I start out usually in the beginning of the year, New Year's resolution, I'm going to eat better, and I – go all out and I make my own granola and I do all this. And then by mm, end of February, March, I'm starting to be like, okay, let's just go buy the easy stuff that's easy to make. How can people at home make it easier for themselves? You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, it's just I map out in the book all these very simple strategies that basically – just start out purchasing whole grain versions of foods you already eat. So, of course, actually most American surveys show they eat their whole grains at breakfast because it's just so easy to buy 100% whole grain breakfast cereals and things like that. 
uh, switch your bread over, switch your pasta over, you know, switch out your crackers, you know, prepared foods like that. It's just a simple shopping change. And people love graham crackers and triscuits and wheat thins and things, so it's not that drastic. Right. And then from there, you can go, go to, say, cooking up a big batch of grains once a week and using it throughout the week. And you can use, you know, if you cook just a big pot of, say, barley, you can heat that up with some milk and honey for breakfast. You can heat it up in a soup for lunch. You can heat it up and put stir fry or stew or something over it at dinner. And so you've got your whole grain ready to go. So you don't need that 20 minutes or 30 minutes to cook it. It's always good to think about, you know, the long term. I know that's why I put the health benefits in there uh, so that it's, I think that's motivating to remind yourself, you know, that there's a good reason for doing it. And, um, And I think the most important thing with any dietary change or resolution, although I don't like really making a resolution because they often die, is is you have to set yourself up to succeed. So, and you have to do it for a while, commit to doing something until it becomes a habit. You know, if someone has to do something Mm -hmm. many times before it becomes a habit, you know, there's some of us who go to the gym just regularly, and then every January, there's this little crowd of people who show up for a month, month and a half, never come (laughs) back. And so... Yeah, so you have to do, you know, keep with something until it really does become a part of your life. And part of that, like I say, is just changing your shopping habits and just making sure that's what's in your house so that when you're hungry, that's what you're going to have, you know. So it's just a crucial little steps like that and making sure that you've sort of scoped it out. Okay, what are the options if I do want to grab takeout? You know, if I just really can't bear to cook, is there some place that I can grab, take out, or, you know, order that I can get something better? I, the book is beautiful. The grains are awesome. Pictures of all the different colors, things that, you know, the normal person, I guess, unless you are really into whole grains, aren't used to seeing those. Where, like, where even in the grocery store do you find all of those different varieties? I'm not sure I've heard of all of them before. You know, and a lot of it, you know, that's one of the frustrating things about it is, you know, is whole grains. Certain stores will stock certain whole grains, you know, but generally, I mean, the natural food stores will have the most complete um, whole grain selection. But it's become so mainstream now that even regular grocery stores here, at least where I shop, you can find quinoa and, and assorted, you know, interesting like red rice, black rice and some of the more obscure things, maybe teff or amaranth, you'd have to go to a natural food store. And, of course, you can get anything you want online if you want to give it a try. What happens when, for instance, my family was vegetarian. We were vegetarian for about 16 and a half years. Long story how we stopped being vegetarian. But I still have one child that has never eaten meat in his life. He is not vegan. He's vegetarian. But he doesn't tend to go towards the healthy items when he's eating. I mean, he likes the really like mac and cheese and, you know, lots of breads. He's he's a, a carb eater, a big carb eater. Now, is there a big difference in if you're buying a whole grain pasta? Oh, sure. Well, it's so much better because there's going to be more fiber, so there's going to be less of a blood sugar spike. You know, it's lower on the glycemic index, so it's not quite so refined. And all the whole grains are going to have much more, you know, minerals and vitamins in them than refined grain. You know, if they take, I think it's 22 out and put eight back in. And wow. So it's not nearly as nutritious to eat white, you know, so. Right. And in something like mac and cheese or things with a flavorful sauce, you know, I write in the book about the strategy of, you know, using more strongly flavored things that they found with kids. If you made a whole wheat pizza or used whole wheat buns on a sloppy joe, that the flavors that are on that food, they don't even notice that they're eating whole grain. And what about, like, restaurants? I know you're a cookbook expert, but for those of us who do go out to restaurants, and you know, if you have a health issue or a special diet that you are sticking to, it's really hard to find things and make sure that you're getting a whole grain out in restaurants. It's true. You really have to seek them out, you know, and so I know I've um, made lists and, you know, found places here. You can get to know which chains. I know, you know, we go to places like Panera, that's a chain, Mm -hmm. um, places that offer whole grains, and certainly, 
when you see them, you should, you know, order them and let them know that you're interested in them. Right. But it is growing. You know, there is a movement toward it, depending where you are. It's just very interesting because some whole grains have kind of a health food image, you know, like brown rice. Right. Whereas some are considered more gourmet. So if you're in a high-end place, you might see farro or, you know, red quinoa or something being presented as more of a high-end thing. Or, you know, here we have wild rice, which is considered very gourmet. Yeah, that's hard to find in the grocery store. I've looked for that. So I guess I would have to go to, like, a natural food store to find that. Yes, yes. And actually, because I live in Minnesota, we're very proud. We have this beautiful, you know, hand-harvested wild rice that you can't Mm. get in other parts of the country. Right, right. And um, we can buy it here just, you know, at the farmer's market. And it's just incredibly different. Really good. Yeah, nice. Um, But looking at your cookbook, it really is incredible. You have a mixture of every item that you can think of, breakfast, of course, breads, salads, soups, sides, main courses, and then quick snacks, which is great. And then, of course, desserts, which everybody loves desserts. But how, like, if I'm going to have a party and I'm deciding today I'm going to be all Whole Foods, but a lot of the people that are coming don't really tend to eat that way, and I'm a little afraid that they might not like the items. What would you suggest that I pick out of this cookbook that they wouldn't even notice the difference? Right. Well, the first thing is don't say anything. <laughs> okay. There's a big psychology with, you know, with healthy foods, never, ever, especially with kids, you know, or anyone who's resistant, you know, you just serve it and enjoy it. And don't, you know, don't never announce like we're going whole grain kids. Right, right. Because then they're going to think, oh, what's different about this? They're going to be looking for it's some sort of flavor difference. Right. And that's the kiss of death. <laughs> You know, it's if, if, if people are, because it is completely psychological. I mean, there are so many uh, studies that show that people just make these assumptions about healthy food that, oh, they called it healthy. I won't like it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, a dish that's really pretty is the red quinoa crusted baked fish with cucumber and lime salsa. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, since you, if your friends like fish, you know, it's a very likable dish and it's the quinoa is a coating and it's very pretty. And uh, the quinoa feta phyllo triangles, I mean, it's a little fussy making stuff with phyllo, but people love to pick up a, you know, a beautiful phyllo triangle and bite into it and have the quinoa mixed in with melty feta and spinach. I was just looking at the the cornbread over the chili. Yeah, I think my oldest son would love that. Yeah, that's just a wonderful one. And people sort of, you know, if you think all whole grains are brown, well, whole cornmeal is a beautiful yellow food, you know, so you can make things with that. That And people don't think of cornmeal as health food but um, or cornbread, but it can be really quite helpful. Right. Now, um, what do you think about, like, the artificial sweeteners or even Trevia? That one's supposed to be a natural sweetener. Stevia. It go. I've you know been in this business a really long time. Stevia has always been around. You know, um, since the 80s, I remember stevia. It's just a plant you can grow it in your garden. And so mm-hmm. I'm. I think Trevia is a a brand name for an extract that they've made from okay. it. And it's a. I've, I did a whole book on art of, on um, using whole sweeteners. Um, done a little bit of reading about this. So there are molecules in food that are you know hundreds of times sweeter than sugar. On and, and to me. That's what stevia, you know, has. And to me, it tastes like like saccharin or artificial sweetener. You know, it doesn't. It has that aftertaste, yeah. It's a funny taste to me. And so I would just rather eat something less sweet than have a taste that seems so odd. You know, and that's just me. Right. Right. No, I agree. Um, I noticed that you do uh, bake a lot with honey and with maple syrup as well. Um Are there anything else that you can suggest that people, you know, can switch over if they're trying to get away from the white sugars and, of course, stay away from those artificial sweeteners or even the stevia? What else can they use to sweeten their their food? Well, there's um, there's always uh, fruit and fruit juices. There are, you know, just eating things Mm -hmm. that are a little sweet on their own. I mean, depending on how how much you want to avoid it, you know, there are things like sweet potato and squash and carrots and pumpkin that are naturally sweet. But as far as a more concentrated sweetener, you know, one that I really love is palm sugar. 
I don't know if you've had palm sugar. Oh, no, I've never had that. Well, if you've eaten in a Thai restaurant, you may have had it. It's um, it's used a lot in Thai oh. food. It's basically they. It's like maple syrup of Thailand. They tap a coconut palm and they boil the syrup down to make this beautiful sweetener that has just a wonderful caramel flavor. And because it's boiled down from a whole product, it has um, you know minerals and vitamins in it. You know, it's still a sweetener, but it's really delicious and a little goes a long way. Right. No, I'm all into that. I make my own maple syrup with a few little maple trees I have in my yard, so I'm all into that. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that's yeah. where it came from. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody's been looking for sweetener all over the world, so that's sort of what sugar used to be, but then it got all right. refined. Yeah. Right. Right. Now, also, do you have to bake differently when you're using the whole grains? Like, you know, a lot of people just buy that all-purpose flour off the shelf of the grocery store, and that's what they have. And, you know, family recipes lend themselves to that all-purpose flour. Do you have to do anything different, maybe add extra gluten or anything to it if you have a whole grain? Well, that yeah, it sort of depends which kind of baking you're doing. For a, a tender pastry, you would... Um, we use pastry flour, which is made from soft wheat, so it's lower in gluten. And it's also more finely ground, so whole wheat pastry flour is a better substitute. And you can uh, – actually, one of the recipes in the book, I, I did a, a couple of recipes where I showed how you could start out using part white flour and then step it down each time that you made it mm. so that you could sort of gradually taper your family into eating whole grain. And so That's to make idea. that work in a bread, like, say, a yeasted bread – Um, One of the things about whole grains is that they have less gluten because there's more bulk in there from the bran and germ, but also they're more absorbent. Right. So I think sometimes when people will just take a regular recipe and use whole wheat flour instead, it'll come out really dry. And it's yeah. not necessarily because whole wheat is so dry. It's that it absorbs more liquid. And so just using the same recipe doesn't work. That makes sense. You're saying just kind of work it through until eventually you get all down to just the whole wheat. Yes. One of the inspirations in the book was there's a a professor and researcher here at the University of Minnesota who did a study on junior high kids where they just did that in their lunches. And at the beginning of the year, they were eating white flour, bread, rolls, and pizza. And over the year, they just gradually decreased the white flour and increased the whole wheat until at the end of the year they were eating 100% whole wheat and nobody knew any difference. They ate the same amount. They actually were eating more and they did not, nobody knew anything about it and nobody rebelled or, you know, they're always trying to say kids won't eat it, but they ate it just fine. Yeah, it always surprises me when I make things that my kids will eat because I think, oh, this is healthy. But if they don't know it and if it smells good and it looks appetizing, To them, it's just something yummy to eat. You know, and I really did, you know, play around with this psychology because I'm still a private chef, you know, and so I've cooked for a lot of families with kids. And most of them, you know, if they can afford a private chef, been able to have a lot of things. And I found that it is much better to present things as, you know, I could go in there and say, well, I'm a chef and I'm bringing you something interesting and sophisticated, not I'm here to give you some hippie food, you know. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. And the psychology of that really works you know so you have to sort of see what works with your kids but it's it's uh, a friend of mine always jokes about this is too good for children yeah <laughs> and we just say oh this chocolate's too good for children but it's but like I say the last thing you want to say is okay kids you know life is going to get hard now we're going to just eat healthy food because they're just going to dig their heels and say no So the quick snacks, those I think would be perfect to just have around the house. That way when the kids get home, they're not running to, can I get ice cream? Can I get, you know, things like that. Um, Can you pick out one of your quick snack recipes and and tell us about it? Sure, because I did, I really was down and dirty. I mean, I made stuff like, you know, things to put on graham crackers and rice cake tuna melts and one that I have, I've actually served to a lot of people is the savory oatmeal cookies with cheddar. And it's a an oatmeal cookie with just a bit of tiny bit of sugar, but it's really basically savory. And it has herbs and crystallized ginger and little chunks of cheddar cheese in it. And so, you know, everybody loves an oatmeal cookie. And it's actually good with mm. wine. I've taken that to big <laughs> parties. Yeah, yeah, with a little cheese in there. <laughs> and uh, my friend's daughter um, still makes the whole wheat pita pizzas. You know, it's just... Super easy. Just get some whole wheat pitas and put some cheese and vegetables on there, and um, all those. And the the popcorns. You know, I love popcorns, and I did uh, Chex Mix 
type mixtures as well where you can make your lovely seasonings and make these healthy because you know people forget popcorn's a whole grain you know so you can make really tasty snacks like that and everybody's going to like those oh definitely now how did you come up with all these recipes because you know you have all your books have hundreds and hundreds of recipes in them i i gotta imagine that you sit in your kitchen almost like a, a science lab and are putting things together. I mean, they all look delicious. Oh, they're yeah, they're all yummy. Yeah, and then I test them out on people, and that's that's what I do. Like I say, that arts background way way back there is I'm I am creative. So I'm actually working on uh, my ninth book right now. Oh my gosh, you are a busy lady. I stay busy, yes, and I also <laughs> yeah, I'm great for magazines and things like that. So I'm kind of always thinking about food. Right. Well, you wouldn't be able to see that by looking at you. It must be because of how healthy you eat. Yeah, I always think, you know, you can eat plenty of, of the right kinds of food. You know, I certainly don't diet or, or starve myself. I do exercise a lot, but um, I think it's all part of a, a good plan. And like I say, I'd rather feel good and, you know, have energy and, you know, and not have chronic health problems than than eat some sort of a more crazy diet. This is Love You a Brunch, the show for those who'd rather be brunching. I'm Jody Stapler. Today I'm speaking to Robin Asbell, author, culinary instructor, public speaker, private chef, and the author of many cookbooks on healthy food and special diets. Today we're going to talk to her about her seventh cookbook, The Whole Grain Promise, more than 100 recipes to jumpstart a healthier diet. She's going to let us in on some great tips to help bring the whole grain foods into our diets and into the diets of our families. We're also going to talk about some things that have been in the news for the last couple years, such as the hype nut allergy in our country, the gluten-free diet that has become so popular, as well as many other things such as artificial sweeteners. So stick around and love your brunch. Now, if I was going out today, I was going to make one of these recipes for my kids tonight. Now, remember, I have four kids. I have three boys that are 16, 14, and 12, and then I have a 7-year-old daughter. What in this, and they're picky, what in this cookbook do you think I'd be able to get by tonight that they wouldn't notice? It would be something that they'd be happy with. I wouldn't be bad mom for making them eat something that they didn't want to. What could I do? get and make for them that they would like well that cornbread top chili comes to mind um there's also a recipe for a millet corn chowder with chipotle you know i don't know if they like mexican food you know and that's the thing like i said cook for a lot of kids they all are so individual right that's true you know i've had notebooks full of pages where it was like each household i had to keep a list of which vegetables they would eat and which they wouldn't um <laughs> and yeah and some right. kids you know it, he, this kid only eats mushrooms and, you know, and you'd think mushrooms. So most kids, mushrooms off the list. Oh, no, mushrooms, if I did that, they'd have a temper tantrum. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> I want to steer toward, but there's a right. millet corn chowder where you cook the millet in with the soup and then puree it, and it's just this okay. creamy yellow soup that has a little smoky chipotle in it, and it has corn, which kids like, you know, corn is sweet and uh, they love and that. yellow yeah. and friendly. Well, there's a there's a mac and cheese in the book that's made with whole grain macaroni that also has um, vegetables pureed into the cheese sauce, which is one of those recipes I worked up for my private chef clients for the kids who thought they didn't like vegetables. Is I would puree it into the cheese of the mac and cheese. Good idea. That's a great idea. Now, if I wanted to make a multi-grain uh, mac and cheese or a whole grain, where do I get the pasta for that? I mean, is there a specific brand that you recommend? Uh, macaroni is, you know, you should be able to find some. And if if you have to, you can substitute uh, penne or some similar shape. And I don't know, our stores have gotten very good about having it. The texture's a bit different with that, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and so that's why you want to put in a bunch of other stuff. Right. 
would you recommend for something like that, like maybe to mix that in with the stuff they're used to and then, again, slowly work it out until they're eventually all the whole grain? You know what? There's a brand, and I wish I could remember because, but I don't, um, that's, um, it's, it's sort of half and half. You know, there's, there, if you look mm. at the labels, you know, where you could start off with a macaroni that's, there's one that I think is called a higher fiber, you know, where it's part whole grain and, and, uh, you just kind of have to try different brands. And actually, a pasta I use a lot in the book is that you can get a whole wheat angel hair. Okay. And because it's so tiny, you really don't notice, notice the difference it. in yeah. texture. Yeah. You know, it's just this slippery little noodle. Right. I also noticed that you have um, a, a recipe in here for your own baking mix. Yes, and that's a, a strategy for just making something fast, is I make this mixture of whole grain flours and just put in the leavener, and I actually cut a little butter in there so that you can just walk into the kitchen, dump a cup of it into a bowl, stir it up with a little milk, I think, and then pat those out and have them in and out of the oven in 15 minutes. Nice. And I think, and that's been a strategy that I've used with my private chef kids is if, if there's a hot, freshly baked muffin or bread or biscuit, they're going to want it. Yeah. Yeah, that was one of my favorite stories is I had this family where I was told, well, when they get home from school, they eat double step Oreos. And I said, really? <laughs> and so they said, yes, and this is just, is this is the way it is, and you have to make sure they have them. So I started making sure that every day when they came home from school, I was just taking out some fresh whole grain rolls or muffins or, or banana bread, and they quit eating double stuff Oreos. Wow. That's incredible. And That's so, great. Yeah. Because, you know, who can't you walk in the front door of a house and you smell fresh bread? Exactly. Yeah. Can't lose. No. Yeah. Even my picky, my picky, picky vegetarian would probably go for that over the Oreo uh, double stuffed Oreos. That'd probably be the second thing they'd go for, but definitely, especially if you had a fresh, fresh banana bread or a zucchini bread, something like that. Yes, and then you know, then they get too full. Yeah, and then you're just like, well, all right, well, dinner's in an hour, so you know, go run around and play or whatever you're gonna do, or you work on your homework, and you've avoided the processed food trap. Yeah, that's a great idea. And those are probably also something that'd be very good to little muffin wise, but to have around that way, if they do really get hungry or hankering for something to nibble on, they can grab one of those. Yes. Yes. And, you know, a lovely muffin, you know, and you can, some of the muffins in the book, you know, I put a little crunchy sugar on top mm. or, you know, so then you can have that with a little peanut butter or something. And, you know, it really is, you know, delicious and satisfying. And so, I mean, I realize most people don't have a private chef to make sure they have fresh bread when their kids okay. walk in the door. But um, even just having it around is probably a great idea. And that's something, you know what, you can even make as a family on the weekends if you don't have time during the week and have them ready, freeze, their, you know, freeze them and have them ready. Yes, and if you can get your kids to work with you, I mean, it's been shown over and over again that if they're invested – you know, whether it's in working on the garden or, you know, working on the food, they're going to be much more, you know, interested in making sure that it gets eaten. Right. You know, they're much more interested in, in, uh, in, the, in the final product if they participate. Yeah. Now, these cherry cheesecake bars in the dessert section, I'm a big dessert person. They look delicious. Oh, they're so good. When I make those, I, I kind of have to stop myself from <laughs> eating it breakfast and lunch. Yeah, that's yeah. funny. But it, well, the key with those is that the graham crackers are whole grain. You can buy 100% whole grain graham crackers. That's how why graham crackers were invented. And so um, you you just use double graham, and there's actually graham on top. So there's a lot of graham cracker in there. And then I use a lighter cream cheese and put a bunch of fruit on there. And so, you know, it's not too bad as a dessert goes, but it's definitely a dessert. But who's not going to love that, you know? And the fudgy brownie cupcakes, I mean, just the name in itself makes you want to eat it. Yes, yes. So, you know, yeah, life's too short to eat bad food. I, <laughs> Very vigorously. true. Yes, I never eat anything I don't like. You know, people will tell me, oh, I'm trying to eat this or that. You know, I hate kale. I'm making myself eat it. And I say, why? I never eat anything that doesn't taste good to me. 
No, that makes sense. Kale was one of those things that that was the, the big thing to, to go for for a while where they seem yeah. everything seems to kind of go in a big trend like that. Have you noticed that as well? Oh, yeah. There's, it's always interesting how something will become trendy. And, and I'm always glad when it's a natural food, right? You know, I'm glad kale got hot and people learned how to like it. But, of course, then there were the people who overdid it, you know. Right. <laughs> um, right. And so, you know, and people will say, oh, you know, I drank so much kale juice. I never want to see kale again in my life. And I say, well, good. Yeah. Well, there's still broccoli, you know. Right. It's perfectly delicious. And it's, you know, it's splitting hairs to say which thing's better. But, yes, we've always kind of, you know, and I'm part of the food writing establishment. So I, I participate in these things a little bit. But we're always kind of trying to get on trend. So what's the new trend coming up, do you think? Oh, boy. That's the thing. I've known all these foods for so long. I mean, I've been working yeah, with coconut you, oil for all 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you think, oh, well, people ask me what's the next big one. I think um, Frika is a green that, that was hot for a while, and then I think it's going to keep growing. Uh, the New York Times tried to say that sorghum was the breakout green last year, but I'm not seeing it. Yeah. Um, although it was on The Walking Dead. <laughs> well, there you go. It might it might come out then. Yes. No. <laughs> right. Now, let's talk a little bit about this whole gluten thing. It seems like everybody just kind of jumped on the bandwagon of, oh, yes, I'm gluten intolerant. Um, I can't have gluten. And where do you stand on this whole gluten thing? It seems like, like I said, it's just a new trend to hop on. Yes, yes. Well, there I've been to multiple conferences. I actually I was a, I was at the USDA last year with a whole bunch of uh, grain chemists and researchers just discussing this issue. And there's been it's a very complicated thing to explain, but there is a rise in the amount of of gluten sensitivity in the population, mm. but at the most if you add up all the real celiacs and the people who are allergic to wheat, and then a group that as yet they can't do a lab test for it, but they're just calling it gluten intolerance. At most, it's 6% of the population. Right. So the idea that everyone else should go off of gluten or that gluten is a poison or gluten is, you know, just inherently bad for people is something that's really been cooked up. There's no science behind it. Um, you know, it sold a lot of books yeah. and it pings around the internet, but um, gluten in and of itself is just another protein in a plant. Right. That said, I saw a very compelling presentation by Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's a really top gluten expert. He's at the Celiac Center. He was postulating that the rise in gluten problems is perfectly parallel to all the other autoimmune diseases, and that's, you know, arthritis and um diabetes and all these other things and so there is some other mechanism at play that's just basically causing a growth in autoimmune diseases mm -hmm. and there's a big theory right now that a lot of it has to do with the gut biome i know i'm going down a rabbit hole here but that it could be that we've all destroyed our gut bacteria so badly that it's just causing this cascade of effects yeah which completely makes sense so the majority of people who are just, who are just, and, and I used to see this when I worked in a natural food store, is that people saw on a package something free, whether it was cholesterol free or sugar free or gluten free, they would think, well, that must be right. healthier. And in fact, a lot of, a lot of gluten free products are not healthier. A lot of them, and I, I mean, I wrote a book about how to make gluten free pasta. Um, most of them, you have to use a lot of starches and very refined products to make something that tastes good. So if you're buying a gluten-free muffin or a gluten-free bread, it'll actually be um, more like more sweet, higher in calories, mm. you know, not whole grain. And so unless you need to avoid gluten, which some people right. do, and I, I feel for them, my own mother actually, the reason I got into it is my own mother is allergic to wheat. Mm, okay. And I've cooked for I cook for people who are gluten free. I teach gluten free classes, and I meet these people who have just really suffered horribly with this. So it is true and valid. Right. But other people are jumping on. And the thing is, if you gained weight because you eat a lot of pastry yeah. and bread, 
then going gluten-free and giving up all that pastry and bread, you would grab some meat. Yeah, right. You know? Right. You know, cutting out an entire food group is one way to lose weight. It's just probably, yeah. it's not the gluten, and it's probably not sustainable. Right. Good point. Seems like it's happening more and more in our country where, you know, we have so many nut allergies. Whereas when I was a kid, I don't think we had any children in our school that had a nut allergy. And nowadays, it seems like there's at least three or four in each classroom. Now, what what do you think yes. causes that? Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's what that discussion was about the wheat, was that it's actually that people just have weakened immune systems, and so it's an autoimmune reaction. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was a long time a theory just that, well, people just didn't figure it out, because it used to be, you know, say if you had a food allergy, like people who were celiac would just eventually die of it. Right. You know, as nobody really knew what it was, and it was it was bad enough that you would eventually die of malnutrition. Right. So, um but that's one theory that, you know, that it's an autoimmune problem. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of theories about, I mean, anyone who tells you they know why is lying, because I promise you I don't know why. I, I, I lean toward different theories, but we live in a much more complicated world, too. If you look back even 100 years ago, people would have eaten what was from their local area, and it would have been a pretty repetitive standard fare. That's true. You know, you wouldn't have something, a grain from Peru that you wanted to try. Right, right, right. I mean, you didn't go out for Thai one night and the Italian the next. And you know, so, and you didn't have all these ingredients from all over the world. But I would say, you know, the, the sensitivity thing, there's more to that, that we are yeah. not equipped to deal with things. And so there's something going on with our immunity and with our reactions to things. And so, but again, I mean, I... I study it, I read about it, but I have no answer. No answers, yeah. Okay, well, let's go organic, non-organic. You know, I mean, I buy organic, you know, and I think if you can afford to, it's a much better thing. You can look at those lists and try to, you know, if you can't afford to eat organic, you can go for the things that are less sprayed. You know, they have those lists of sort of the top 10 dirty vegetables, you know, as you don't, wouldn't want sprayed, say, strawberries or, you know, there's different things. Actually, over the years, a number of times I have been hired to cook people who had cancer, and they would usually have a protocol that had been put together by a professional, which usually involved a bunch of juicing and organics and, you know, certain kinds of foods. So that was very interesting, although, you know, I think it's better to start before you get cancer. It's just just that's a good reason to start steering in a, you know, in a positive direction so that you're heading that stuff off at the pass because... You know, I mean, you can, any of us could, could get cancer at any time, but you're, you're just lowering your odds when you eat, you know, clean, healthy food. Right. So I, you said that you had another book coming out. Yes. Yes. I have a book called uh, Great Bowls of Food. Ooh, okay. It's going to come out at the end of May and it's very fun. It's uh, the bowl trend, which people are really enjoying eating food in bowls and. Yeah. I uh, I love it because it really works for families and for it, it, for single or for families or for people with mixed diets is that it's all these recipes for assembling food where you can have kids and say they don't want two of the things that are in the bowl, we'll just leave it off their bowl, right? Right. And I've been teaching really popular classes or people are just loving the food, so I'm very much looking forward to having that one come out. Yeah. A lot of grain-based, but because it's so flexible, so there's a lot of the bowls are grain-based, you know, and you pile on vegetables and proteins and a tasty sauce, but you can also do it with uh, vegetables or gluten-free things underneath, so you can cover all the diet styles. Right, and there's just something about a bowl that it just makes you feel like you're eating comfort food. I don't know why, but it is. (laughs) It's true. It's true, yes. And I talk about sort of the mindfulness of the bowl as it can be sort of a Zen practice of making your bowl and putting it together. And Yeah. And um, I know I like, you know, if you're really, you know, hungry and you've just got this big bowl of, of colorful food with lots of different textures and flavors, it's just a great thing to just satisfy yourself fully by eating a big bowl of food. Now, you have a class coming up uh, pretty soon, don't you, a, a dim sum? 
Dim sum. Yeah, that's very fun. Now, how can people find out about your classes? Well, if you want to go to robinasbell.com, I've got um, uh, recipes there, a blog, a list of my events, videos you can watch of me doing TV spots, so all my books. It really is a great website. It has every information that you can find. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy with it. So people can find you on your website at robinasbell.com. Um, where else can they find you? I'm I'm trying to be out there. So, yeah, I mean, just <laughs> Google me. And I'm on Pinterest. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram and um, Google Plus. You know, so, yeah, I'm out there. And I would love, you know. That's good. So, yeah, you're easy to find. Yeah. Yes. If people want to communicate with me uh, on Twitter or Facebook or any of those things, I would love that. Right. And also, you, uh, they're in that area. They can uh, sign up for some of your events, your classes. They look great. And, of course, now your ninth cookbook after this one in May. When do you think the ninth one will come out? That one's supposed to come out January of 2017. So. Okay. And what's what's that one? Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to say yes. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, they, they like, like you to keep these things. No, I got you. I got you. So keep watching the website and keep your eye out. <laughs> keep your eye out to see what it is. It's always exciting. Definitely take a look at the whole grain promise. More than a hundred delicious recipes. So that's great. And for those of you who want to get a little bit healthier, this is a great place to start. And it's a way to help your family make that transition. There's a lot of great tips in it. Thank you so much, Robin, for speaking with us today. Well, thanks. It was great talking to you. Thank you to Robin Asbell for joining us today and sharing such great tips. Pick up her book, The Whole Grain Promise, and look out for her next two. For more information on Robin Asbell, visit her on her website at robinasbell.com. You can also find her at our website, loveyourbrunch.net. Also, thank you for tuning in to Love Your Brunch. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please subscribe, leave us a review, and join us on our Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram at Love Your Brunch. If you have a question or comment, you can email me at jody at loveyourbrunch.net or Skype us at Love Your Brunch Podcast. Also, visit our website at loveyourbrunch.net for any information about our episodes. Join us again next week. I'm Jody Stapler, and Love Your Brunch.